Famous musicians, Oscar-winning actors, legendary sports figures, and even war heroes all have one thing in common. It all must come to an end. I'm your host, Ed Doyle, and these are stories of fame and fate. Michael Jackson called him the funniest comedian in the world. Frank Sinatra was quoted once as saying, I only want to do two things, sing with the London Philharmonic and be at one of his auditions. Burt Reynolds said, there's only one of him. And his biggest fan ever, none other than Charlie Chaplin. Benny Hill was a man that had the admiration of superstars and the love of millions of people worldwide. On January 21st, 1924, in Southampton, Hampshire, England, Alfred Hawthorne Hill Jr. was born to Alfred and Helen Hill. This is the story of one man's rise to incredible fame and his fate of extreme public adulation and criticism. Alfie, as his family called him, had his first exposure to show business at a mere 12 years old, when his grandfather would take him backstage of the local ever so racy variety shows. He was mesmerized by the near naked female chorus girls that he would see in the back dressing rooms. But what stayed with him was the magic that the comedians seemed to have over their audience. He once said that he was amazed at the laughs that they would get from the audiences and the fact that they were always surrounded by pretty women and that they got top billing and he figured they had to be the ones making the most money. That's for me, he said. Alfie may have gotten the bug for entertaining from his father and grandfather. His grandfather was a circus clown as a boy and Alfie's father ran away to join the circus also. His father settled down later in life, though, and ran a medical appliance shop, which featured, of all things, condoms. The store even had a big wooden phallus on the counter, which was used for demonstration purposes for the condoms. The Hill family owned their house, but they were far from rich and actually had many financial problems. His parents were very frugal, and they were fearful of banks and financial institutions. They were a real example of the old save your cash inside the mattress type of people. Alfie's father was very strict and insisted that his children address him as captain. His mother, on the other hand, was a very soft-spoken woman that adored her son and often looked the other way for a lot of his crazy antics. Later in life, during an interview, he said that when his father had died, he cried buckets, but when his mother died, he didn't shed a tear. He felt that the reason might be that he felt he had not loved his father as much as he should have, and that is what saddened him so. At a very early age, Alfie Hill began his quest for stardom. He would appear in school and local talent competitions, but the problem was he just wasn't funny. The closest he ever came to winning a competition was when he came in second to a boy that ate razor blades and sewed buttons to his face. Alfie's father demanded that he get a real job, and so he went to work at the local Woolworths department store cleaning up dog poop. Never not trying to be the funny man though, Alfie Hill would constantly try to make the girls that work beside him laugh. And later, when he became a milkman, he would entertain the housewives at the doors that he delivered to. 
At night, he would play the guitar and perform the odd kind of comic interlude for his friends, but it wasn't enough. Alfie Hill wanted to be on stage, so he packed up his cardboard suitcase, took his life savings of 25 pounds, and was off to London. The world around him was in peril as a world war was about to happen, and theaters started to close. But Alfie Hill was determined to be a star and not let this interrupt him. As he began his long road to stardom, he decided that his name sounded, as he put it, like a cheap barrow boy. And it was at that point that Alfie Hill changed his name to Benny, as both a tribute to Jack Benny, and he thought the Jewish sounding name might give him a little leverage in the business. Benny Hill would perform wherever he could, in music halls, at Stratham Commons, and even in air raid shelters. Benny would get his first real playing gig at the East Ham Palace as an assistant stage manager for the show called Follow the Fun. He would earn three pounds, 10 shillings a week for being literally an errand boy. Benny would later join the touring review, Send Him Victorious, having small bits where he could try his hand at being funny. But with the war raging in Europe, Benny would get called for active duty. But because the troop moved so often from town to town, Benny Hill's call-up papers wouldn't catch up to him. Unknowing that he was being drafted, Benny went on with the tour, and at Cardiff's new theater, authorities finally caught up with him. Benny was not at all a draft dodger. He simply had no idea that he was being called, but authorities nonetheless threw him into a police cell where, as he put it later in life, he was treated like a criminal. An armed guard came to escort Benny Hill off to Catterick in Yorkshire, and it was that experience that many believe was the reason for his lifelong fear of authority. Private Hill joined the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers as a driver slash mechanic. The problem was that he was completely incompetent as a mechanic, and he was even worse as a driver. It was his gift, though, for foreign languages that allowed him to make it through the service. And ironically, with the weight problems that would plague him in later years, at this point, he was deemed too fit to leave the fighting to audition for concert parties. When the fighting ended though, Benny auditioned for the military stars in battle dress, and he would tour musical bases across England in shows such as Happy Weekend, and it's all fun. When Benny finally left the army, he got his first real break as a straight man to comedian Reg Varney. The review that was called, very innocently back then, Gay Time. For over two years, the pair worked together and one night, Benny had his chance for a solo act. He performed his heart out, but the audience gave him the infamous slow clap of death in criticism for what they felt was a bad performance. Benny Hill was devastated and quit the review. He didn't give up his dream of being a funny man though. In contrary, it made him all the more determined. As bad as that night was for Benny, it did give him one magical result. It was the night that he would first meet with Richard Stone, a talent agent with whom Benny Hill would loyally stick with his entire life. Benny decided to change his path by trying his hand at writing comedy sketches. He wrote several, and one day he brought them to a BBC executive telling him that he felt that the new medium of television was going to be in need of material. Confident in his work, he told the exec to go ahead and pick any sketch from the pile. They were all that good and he was that confident about them. But Benny was told that instead he should be the one to act one out rather than the exec reading them. And after reading aloud one of the sketches, he was asked who he thought should do these bits. Benny replied, well, anyone really. I wrote them that way so that anybody can do them. The BBC executive looked at Benny and said, well, I think you should do these. And so the Benny Hill Show was born right in that office in 1956. 
The Benny Hill Show was produced as one-hour specials that was only supposed to air a few times a year. But it quickly became the BBC's number one top-rated show. At one point, it appealed to over 50 million viewers in the UK alone. Both the BBC and Benny Hill had captured the attention of viewers all over the UK. But in 1969, the BBC was shocked to learn that Benny Hill would leave them to sign a contract with ITV's Thames Television. During the late 70s, Thames Television purchased a block of airtime on two stations in the largest markets in the U.S., WOR-TV in New York and KHJ-TV in Los Angeles would be America's first stations to expose the Benny Hill Show to American audiences. Heavily edited to fit the U.S.'s FCC rules, these ITV Benny Hill specials were presented as half-hour versions with far less risque material than what was in their original form in the UK. Audiences immediately were thrilled with this new type of vaudeville burlesque childish type of comedy and the show became a hit with the audience wanting more. When told of his fame growing in the US, Benny really didn't believe the stories. But when all of the letters and of course the checks started coming in from the US, Benny quickly realized that he had obtained the fame he had only ever dreamed of. Benny visited New York City not long after and he was absolutely amazed on how he was mobbed by the fans. He couldn't walk down the street without people clamoring over him asking for his autograph. It was said by friends that Benny was actually a little embarrassed by his fame and by the amount of money he was making and actually felt a little guilty for it. Benny's friend and co-star Henry McGee said in an interview that Benny was a regular bloke as he called him. Even with all of his fame and money he would simply rent a small apartment so he could be close enough to walk the three miles to the studios. McGee said he was amazed when Benny had him over to the apartment to find that it only contained a couch, two chairs, and a television. One of Benny's co-stars later said that Benny Hill didn't need much at all to be content. A roof over his head, a cooker, and a telly was all that he needed with the telly being at the top of the importance list. Benny was indeed a regular bloke, no airs about him, walking wherever he went, and as Henry McGee said, always in a good mood. McGee said that in the 20 years that he had known Benny Hill, that he never once saw him in a bad mood or ever see him raise his voice at anyone. With Benny's fame and wealth growing, the press started getting very curious about him. They wanted to know why this loner, who was always surrounded by beautiful women and worth millions of pounds, would simply rent a small flat in Teddington by himself. Was Benny Hill gay? He's never been married. What could Benny Hill possibly be hiding from the public? The bad press and rumors that went on never bothered Benny Hill. He made light of the things that he would read in the paper. At the studio one day, he was asked if he had seen that morning's headlines, and Benny simply asked, Oh God, what am I today, a comic genius or a dirty old man? Benny went on with his racy but innocent comedy bits, writing most of his own material himself. He would gain worldwide fame and appear in movies such as The Italian Job, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines, and more. As Benny Hill was becoming more and more popular in the U.S., and even from China to the Soviet Union, controversy was brewing at home in the U.K. Critics started saying that his comedy was crossing the line and bordering on sexism. John Davies, former head of entertainment at Thames Television, said that the show was becoming kind of repetitive and the scantily clad women became out of date and out of fashion. Mary Whitehouse, who was an English social activist, 
started to write letters to Thames that berated the Benny Hill show, saying, if we allow that kind of smut on television, then where will it end? With the gossip growing and opinions of those that were either jealous of Benny or extremely prudish, and with all of the changing times going on around him, Benny was now being called a relic by some of his fellow comedians. The press would say, Benny's looking old. Benny's looking fat. It doesn't look right for a 65-year-old man to be chased by 20-something-year-old women in bikinis. Back home in the UK in 1989, Benny was notified that the head of entertainment at Teddington Studios wanted to see him. Benny was told that because the audiences were getting smaller, that his contract was not going to be renewed. Benny Hill simply nodded and said, okay, and left the studio. Benny said later that he was hurt more than anything else. He said that he understood that business is business, but a little pat on the bat would have been nice as he was there with them for 22 years. Benny was devastated. The Benny Hill Show was his baby. It was his whole life, and it had just been taken away from him. It was said that the twinkle in his eye was gone. The fun of life had left him. With the show being canceled and nothing to do, Benny began to mope and his poor diet worsened as he would continually eat to feel better with a diet of unhealthy snacks and food. In less than three years, Benny developed heart trouble and soon he would have his first heart attack. While in the hospital, Benny was told that he needed to have a bypass, but Benny refused after being told that the operation was only 70% successful, and he left the hospital. On Saturday morning, April 20th, 1992, Benny's friend and producer, Dennis Kirkland, phoned Benny Hill, but got no answer. Being concerned that he had not heard from him all day, he called again later in the evening. Still, no answer. The next day, Benny's neighbors called Kirkland saying that they could hear Benny's TV on all night long, but they hadn't seen him in two days and that he would not answer the door. Kirkland immediately went to Benny's apartment and tried knocking on the door, but got no answer. He asked neighbors to help him put a ladder up so that he could get onto Benny's balcony. And when he looked in, he said, there he was, sitting on his couch, shoes off, shirt open, and the TV blaring away. Benny Hill was dead. Benny Hill was buried here in Hollybrook Cemetery, Southampton, England, in a very ordinary grave. Even after Benny's death, the gossip and rumors continued, and one such rumor was that he had been buried with some of his valuables with him because of the contesting of his will. Six months after his burial, Benny Hill's grave was found opened and part of the top of his coffin was missing, but thankfully his body was undisturbed. Nobody really knows if the grave robbers found anything more than just an impish grin on Benny Hill's face with his hand giving his famous Benny Hill salute. <laughs>